Welcome to the May 2022 Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium reading. This is our 25th Zoom-based reading. Uh, it's the beginning of our third year of readings online via Zoom, connecting as we do now with poets in our area, uh, the Monterey Bay area, but also uh, in other states uh, and in other countries. So uh, welcome to this, uh, this experience. Uh, we're doing this, continue to do, us, do it as we, as we work our way through the turbulence that's in the world, uh, coronavirus variant, heaven knows what now uh, in the wings, uh, doing what it's doing, um, authoritarianism abroad in the world and here at home. Um, we've got this senseless invasion and war uh, going on in Ukraine. Uh, we've got a Supreme Court, uh, the majority of the justices of which were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote. Uh, and they're now wreaking havoc uh, in, uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride that we're in, and uh, times are challenging. And I have read that some people have said the relatively benign piece of the post war era that we've known for the last 75 years may be gone. Whatever the case may be, um, we've got poetry this afternoon. And I'd like to invite you all to, and I thank you for joining us to step back, uh, settle down and into some poetry that's brought to you by the Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium. The consortium being an organization that has been around for decades, it traces its roots back to some poets uh, in our area who met and read. Uh, and then that uh, experience, um, molded and morphed into a program that the National Writers Union, uh, the local Monterey Bay uh, chapter uh, hosted uh, under the aegis of the work of John Lowey, who uh, was the Dean of the organization, who has been the founder of the consortium and uh, who is uh, our uh, emeritus uh, leader now. Uh, the current uh, leader and the coordinator for our group is Kent Leatham, who's here with us. And uh, he's picked up the mantle and is guiding us forward. We're going to have poetry from two wonderful poets, uh, Andrew uh, Fague and Stan Rushworth, uh, who are um, terrific poets uh, and uh, have not had the chance to read with us, at least in this new format. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So we're going to start with Andrew, uh, who lives up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, and that's where he's coming from today. Uh, he has for 20 years uh, taught writing, literature, mythology, and poetry workshops at various colleges uh, on the West Coast, and he's currently doing so at Cabrillo College uh, in Watsonville. Um, Andrew's poems have appeared in Catamaran, Wall, Chicago Quarterly uh, Review, Salt, the Porter Gulch Review, Frenzy, and other places. So he's got a wide range of work that he's given to the world. Uh, through these uh, various publications. And uh, Andrew, it's, uh, it's up to you and we're delighted to have you, over to you. All right, well, thanks, Bob. Um, thanks for including me in this uh, Monterey Bay Poetry Consortium reading and the tradition that you have going on. Um, it's an honor and um, it's an honor to read with Stan uh, today. So, um, and happy Mother's Day, uh, everyone. So. Um, I'm, I figured I would read poems on, uh, on mothers and Mother Earth uh, for the holiday. So I wanted to start with, let's see. Oh, yeah, you're still there. Okay. Um, a poem called The Fruit. And um, it's, I guess, just about uh, Eve's offering of uh, fruit from the tree of knowledge. So I, I thought I'd start there and um, just how grateful I am for that offer of hers. And um, I think the speaker's sort of explaining why uh, he's grateful um, to, the, to the big man, to the, the man upstairs for this mm -hmm. offering. So the fruit, and there's an epigraph that you'll probably recognize here. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. But God, these tiny dark plums in the green and the dead of summer, 
pinpricks of blood not yet exposed to air. My cousin asked, are those black cherries? They're nothing extraordinary, but God, the sun beaming through the busy leaves into the skin of the fruit, shallow warmth, subtle shaking from the twig, the core's pit loose as the walls could melt into juice. The moan of bees and the apple blossoms now, another plummet through pollen freely offered up, a covenant to keep one and the other alive, as though union were all we needed again and again ad infinitum. And then I wanted to read a poem about my mom. And I realized uh, I haven't written a poem about her for about I don't know, over 20 years. I, I don't know why, except that uh, we still get to talk all the time. We have an amazing, I guess, relationship. And, and um, I don't know, maybe there's nothing to write a poem about. But uh, so I went back to my first collection of poems that I did for, um, for my master's thesis at San Francisco State. I think it's down there. I like to think it's, it, it's in the library somewhere. And I, I like to think of the library having like catacombs underneath and, um, and that it's, there's dust and cobwebs and somewhere down there is this uh, collection. And um, it's called Mom Dusk, Coal Red. I call this coin light, this shrug, urchins sting the sky right in the clouds. Their shake, the ice and rain is all we get, I say. It was she who spread the swelling across the cirrus until it faded. And I'll never find her in darkness, I say, and walk home. And then uh, I have a poem about, well, there's a uh, mother of my children and my kids in this one. Um, so I thought it would fit the theme. It's called Backyard of Gold. October, the day begins to slant spotlight under a stall of dense willow tree branches, a hammock chair from Nicaragua carried home from our honeymoon, now dirtied, misshapen by our two kids, presently aglow, warm and white fibers, attended by skinny leaves, malnourished cherubs bathing in what is lit, a ragged beauty of a day. Our rakes and shovels leaned into the corner of the fence with stripped branches for garden stakes and for twirling, hitting stuff, pretending their brooms to fly around a backyard of gold like hummingbirds and finches. Old California woken from a recurring dream of living under sea where her wrinkles moved, undulated in the light. And I wanted to um, mention, yeah, so this next poem, uh-oh, here it is. Um, I mentioned Old California and, you know, uh, it's just listening to someone talking about how anthropologists and archaeologists are saying that um, the conservative estimate now is that people have been living in this area, Monterey Bay area for 15,000 years. And so thinking about, again, the theme of, of Mother's Day and mothers, grandmothers, and this would be great mother, great grandmothers, and great, great grandmothers, and how many generations upon generations of, um, of going back into this history and living in, in the same places and renewing those relationships with their ancestors uh, through ceremony, over all those years, I can probably only comprehend about a thousand years of that, much less, uh, you know, a lot of people say, indigenous people say, well, since the dawn of time, you know, our origin is over there at the foot of that mountain or at the convergence of these rivers or whatever it is. Um, Daryl Bay Wilson, indigenous scholar and writer, uh, talks about his childhood and he, and he says um, that his parents told him, your ancestors are always watching. And, um, so I try to think about that, just reflect on it personally. And, you know, for me, I, uh, I moved to California when I was seven months old. 
and um, my mom's sisters and their families came out too. And so we're kind of like the first Californians um, in, my, in, in my family. So when I think about my ancestors, well, they're back in Missouri and then like, I don't know, I think Pennsylvania and Germany and Ireland going back, you know, past through the 1800s and, and before. And so I was like, well, so do ancestors, do they, do they travel with you then when they're watching over you or, or they're different or they're different ancestors watching me now that I'm in California? How does that work? And how have I, you know, in this last little sliver, 400 years or so of the colonization, you know, how, how, how have I been influenced and how to see these, uh, these people that were here before me? So it's a long introduction, but um, the title of the poem is uh, Apparition. Apparition and child is a mother and child, but it's apparition and child. There was a home where my childhood house was leveled, framed, finished, sold to my parents. We awoke with street lights in the windows, took turns showering, combing hair. In the dim pre-dawn, I walked the lawn, bent to scoop our dog's poop into a paper bag. When I looked up, I saw her. My eyes shifted toward the sliding glass door, a glow with a family shuffling around breakfast, then back to this calm earth-colored woman who looked like a farmer, sunbaked, at home under the olive tree. Her eyes were following the deeply engraved black bark and curved boughs. Water leaked from dark crevices around her eyes as a spring trickles from ground. And I chose to see the sparkle. I loved that tree too, and the taller sycamore. My brothers and I climbed and crossed between them over a green lawn mussed by ever-growing roots until they grew too large in my father's eyes and were excavated with the trees. I could see what she thought of shade from the dew, from the sun. Back inside, I looked out from the kitchen table. She was still there and I wondered whether she was homeless, if she'd steal from us or go on welfare. Sit with your back against your chair. I ran through what I'd studied for a test at school. She was remembering something she hadn't forgotten. Her face looked glad, then worried, darkening. I stared into my porcelain bowl. And then, um, so did Stan show up? Not quite yet? No, no. <laughs> okay. Don't have him yet. He just, uh, his helper just sent me an email. And they curious, I was just, I've been working with him over the last, Say that again. I, I, he just, his, whoever's helping him log on said that the code didn't work. So I sent him what I have and got in on. So okay. hopefully that'll work. Nice. Good. Um, yeah. So I, I've been working with him, you know, for uh, several years at Cabrillo College. And he's, um, he's really become a mentor for me um, as an Indigenous scholar and, and someone who's created uh, and run a couple classes at Cabrillo over the last. 30 years, um, there's indigenous uh, literature in the fall and then indigenous literature and history in the spring and um, slowly kind of been nurturing me, me in to take over those classes. And uh, part of the process of, of working with the students, whether they're indigenous or not, um, in understanding literature is of course, understanding the history and it's a, it's a brutal history uh, of colonization and uh, cultural, genocide and erasure and and so it's a lot to take on for students and and for me and um and then we get to the of course the gorgeous works of indigenous literature that we read um but i've noticed you know when i write i'm sitting in by myself I, i'll write about anything but I've, I've over the last couple months i've noticed i have a lot of poems about healing and so I decided, and of course, all the things that Bob mentioned at the start of the uh, reading <laughs> with the pandemic and everything that's going on uh, right now um, just kind of keeps coming up. So I, uh, I, I put together a cycle of poems called 13 Ways of Looking at Healing. 
And I thought I'd read before, hopefully we can pass it on to Stan. Um, I thought I'd read the first seven poems of this cycle. So 13 ways of looking at healing. One, if you, if you took a year off freeways, looked, listened to the back roads, the birds, corner markets, overpasses, if every time you put bark or orange or any peel to your nose, you could, for a second, say goodbye to your juicy insides. If you could be fearless of your senses, allow them to brew and flavor and concoct what they would and not them them. If you could get rid of if too and motivate, does the heart have to motivate the lung? Does a little indicator light need to be blinking? Look at your hands, feel them ready to respond. What holds them back? What can't they control? If you could get rid of anywhere you've been, why? Two, branch out with your needles into the bees, into the rosemary, manzanita, cherry flowers. Your name never was Douglas Fir, choking on smog, moving to the music of wind and light. So all different perspectives, I should have said that. Three, you pull out your collar, open your cloak, toss them into your own stone fireplace. The chimney smokes, you pray, beg your God, set all those little boys free, including you, once a fine, not so upstanding, giggling, milk suckling citizen of the world. Did they leave your dirty diaper on too long? What happened? What keeps happening? Four. You slow with the traffic for the dazzle of the wreck. Red vapors float from tailpipes, nightmarish around the gurney. It could have been you staring up, allowing all onlookers. Five. Unity is an old story made of many stories. How a God can appear to you as a beggar. How the earth, sky, and sea are siblings. How, because of a conflict over sheep, the Laguna hosted a feast for the Navajo countless years. Just a random incident, a fragment made whole by being given a part. What will your stories become? Six, instead of strapping on her leaf blower, your neighbor plays the vibraphone softly through the air into the leaves. You bring your broom over to sweep. You're leaning, joking, shooting the breeze when you're startled awake by her leaf blower. Your dream lingering, beginning everything, Saturday morning, the whole weekend ahead. You warm your mug with tea and pretend the heat's from that ridiculous hollow blowing. Sit against the shed and hear it like a highway. From cupped hands, you stick your thumb out. She takes her finger off the trigger, a moment of pause, then roars at more dust and grass. There's a backwind like from a car gone past. Or a pickup with a more metal bed and against the front, behind the cab, a rider, you, slouched, watching a favorite rocky green coast unwind in a light you know as memory, nothing to do but watch. There's another interlude in the noise, extending like cars in opposite directions. You blow steam in the breeze, Ponder how the jack pine by the fence brought its music this far west. How illusion and reality can be strummed together, a diminished chord in the song for the love of fate. 
seven. You get a hold of the strings within you, pull them taut, string them out, play them until they sing like the beginning of the world. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. That was that was terrific. And um, it looks like we do have Stan on board. And uh, Stan, we'll be with you in just a little bit. Welcome. It's great to see you. And uh, Andrew, thank you for that. I, I loved. Um, I love some of your images, especially when you talk, when you took us to healing, because God knows that's something that's so important to us these days. Uh, and I loved your advice to be fearless of your senses and get rid of if. Uh, those are two wonderful little pieces of teaching. Uh, and then, of course, uh, could resonate with you and uh, connect with you when you were startled awake by a leaf blower. <laughs> uh, that that does happen uh and then and then the poet sitting uh in the in the cab of the pickup looking at the coast it was just beautiful uh, and fifteen thousand years of generations uh, in our monterey bay area is really quite incredible when you think about that um we have some family who have a ranch in the castorville area uh on which some work was being done and they found a woolly mammoth. Uh, and woolly mammoths were walking around the slough there uh, in Monterey County, well and truly uh, after human beings were here. And uh, just the notion that for 15,000 years, way, way, way back then, the people you were connecting us with would have seen that woolly mammoth. Uh, and uh, uh, it does give you a sense of connection to the timelessness of things. And as you said, to the generation after generation after generation of mothers uh, whom we do celebrate today. And uh, I guess I would also say that I love the, the line in, in the fruit, the sun beaming through the busy leaves, uh, leaves doing their work, uh, keeping uh, the tree alive, uh, which is just wonderful. So Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, Spoke, great yeah. to have you with us. Great to have your poetry, and we appreciate you sharing it with us. Stan Rushworth, uh, our second reader, was born in 1944 and raised on the banks of the Stanislaw River in East San Joaquin, in the East San Joaquin Valley, by his grandfather, who was of Cherokee descent. Uh, Stan has taught Native American literature, as Andrew said, at Cabrillo for the last 28 years, and has done similar work at uh, UC Santa Cruz as a lecturer. He's a tenured faculty emeritus at Cabrillo and continues to teach Native American literature and works as an activist, an advocate for indigenous people and as a teacher and as a writer and a speaker. He also worked for 18 years at Cabrillo's Watsonville Center teaching basic skills and critical thinking surrounding indigenous people's issues, including serving, his serving for six years as director and instructor of the Puente program which is centered in the Chicano community. Stan is the author of Sam Woods, American Healing, and published in 1992, and Going to Water, the Journal of Beginning Rain, published in 2014. His latest book, just published in April of this year, is a collection of interviews on climate change, which he co-edited with Dar Jamal, and is entitled, We Are the Middle of Forever, Indigenous Voices from Turtle Island on the Changing Earth. Uh, which, um, which is so important for us to consider and, and talk about now. Stan, will we be hearing uh, something with regard to that, uh, the changing earth, the climate, and what's going on uh, in our world? Well, I'm not going to read from We Are the Middle of Forever because the pieces are long. Uh, they're usually 15 to 17 pages. and. Um, I really recommend everyone to get this book if you're concerned about the changing earth. If you're uh, if you're if you're listening to all that, this book, uh, Dar Jamal and I did it uh, over the last two years. It's interviews with eleven women and nine men uh, about climate change and. 
Dar had written a book called uh, The End of Ice. Uh, he's actually an unadmitted war reporter during the Iraq war. Uh, wrote a bunch of stuff about that. Uh, actually, you know, sent his dispatches to Amy Goodman and The Guardian. <laughs> great, great stuff. And then he saw all this environmental devastation and he's a mountain climber. He's a, a, a rescue worker on Denali. And uh, he saw the, the ice going away. And so he went around the world, talked to climate scientists, indigenous people, and wrote the advice. And uh, we became friends. And um, I was at a lot of his presentations and people were going, well, this is the end of life as we know it. We have all these, all these extinctions happening. And I commented to him, you know, if you want to know how to deal with the end of life as you know it, talk to an Indian, okay? And, I, and so we did. And we spent two years talking to young people, old people, ceremonial people, people that no one's ever heard of, very famous, uh, globally famous Indians. In fact, one of our interviews uh, just won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, for poetry, and that's Natalie Diaz, and she, who is just one of those people that you instantly fall in love with, right? I mean, just, just absolutely, she just leaps into your being, right? She's an amazing person. She actually helped finance the book uh, after we interviewed her. She was so excited that she came forth with uh, but Takiev is a, a fellowship that she has at uh, a native a supporting fellowship uh, at Arizona State. Uh, so we all became fast friends. Since you're all writers, you will know, you'll be pleased to know what we did in approaching this book. Right from the get go, we said our four questions, how, are we get, how did we get here? How do we move on in the best way possible? What's getting in the way of us moving on in the best way possible? And no matter the outcome, how do we comport ourselves? Natalie just like went ape with that. And she just went, yes, yes, that's the question. That's the question every single day, okay? So this book is just full of that. It has philosophical tools, it has emotional tools, it has every day what they call practical tools, you know, what to, what to do in your garden, how to treat other people, social justice tools. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And the top, the hardest writing I've ever done because I tell my stories, I tell the stories of my friends, my, my culture and stuff. But this, I had to, I had to take an hour and a half of uh, conversation with somebody where we just let them say whatever they wanted to say regarding those questions, knowing that nothing would go into print without their complete agency. All right, so you can imagine the freedom that was in there. So this book is full of that freedom. I'm not going to read from it today. I'm going to read from Diaspora's Children, which is my latest book before that. And I'm going to read in honor of my mom. And, you know, Andy, I'm glad you brought up the 15,000 years because there are people here today who are my very, very close friends and brothers and sisters in the native community who can sit on a rock and look out over the valley there in Big Sur or even right around here and know that one of their relatives has been sitting on that rock or had been sitting on that rock since what my friend Greg Castro calls the dawn of time. So 15,000 years is only what modern anthropologists admit to. For native people, it's since the dawn of time, since creation. And the more deeply they dig, the, the more the archeologists realize this, okay? So part of my family is 
is native. And this piece, uh, Cherokee, right? So, and I'm also a, a member of the Sakande and De, which is what people call Chiricahua Apache Nation, all right? And I'm also Irish and English, right? And all four of those work well for me, okay? So I can feel the land coming up through me, whether I'm in England or Ireland or here or in South Carolina. But this, this is a story, diaspora's children, There's, there are so many people like us, like me. Uh, so many people like me at Cabrillo College that I just resigned from in protest of a uh, of really poorly done ethnic studies hire that completely eliminated any inclusion of Native American people in the outreach with me being uh, the lone Native American teacher at that college for 30 years and being adjunct for the last 14. It's a shameless, shameless thing that went through. And I hope that my uh, resigning wakes some people up to the fact that Indians have something really valuable to say to the whole culture. And I wish Cabrillo knew that. But at 79, I can't deal with uh, stupidity anymore. So I know I'm among friends here. <laughs> So I'm being pretty upfront. Besides, I don't work there anymore, so I can be as upfront as I want, right? Free country. Yeah. Okay, this is called Blood Rushes In. I mean, blood rushes out, because it's all about blood quantum and stuff. Blood rushes out, culture rushes in. Blood rushes out, culture rushes in. It's a funny and beautiful thing that for many Indian people today, while families marry into other nations and outside indigenous nations altogether, the cultures rise up like an ancient hand and take hold of the heart and they do not let go despite the ravages of invisibility and erasure from the common mind. Missing and murdered indigenous women, teen suicide, Gangs, alcoholism, violence. These are the products of America's denial. It's refusal to see Indians as anything other than something they can use. Children suffer when not seen, not attended to. If it's land and copper that are desired, uranium or coal, anachronisms can't be heard as having rights, so take them and call it infrastructure and progress, even economic sustainability on the world stage. The people are a concept, nothing real to obstruct the taking. It has not changed in 200 years, despite protestations that it's much better now. These are the mechanics of it, the simple things to say about desecration's acceptance, about the, the habit of it, if what's wanted is on the inside of a person, a matter of the soul, someone will sell an American version of ceremony in the newspaper. They'll sell a mystical truth to cover over the natural and inevitable hunger they have, the hunger that had to have risen alongside the predatory killing. Indians are Jesus hanging from the cross, guilt, sin, and blame. This is the name of the game. Trudell sings to a hard rock and roll beat. Sell something to still the pain we all have. In the midst of this, the young native woman brings a pheasant wing and sage to a meeting asking for indigenous students to come form a support group, a club in a local college, Cabrillo. One student comes someone looking to learn about the Cherokee side of her family, another lonely story of diaspora. And I don't wonder why there are no other students there. 
this is an institution in which they are invisible. And asking them to come forward is asking them to confront everything society runs away from. Who are they to confront an institution this big on its own turf? Still, the young woman is there with her sage, though she does not smudge us. And I don't ask her why not. Is it a matter of numbers? Are there not enough of us for the sage? But she's there and her family does ceremony today. I'm many nations, she says with clarity and pride. And later she reveals that one of them is Cherokee and I smile. We are truly everywhere and we look like everyone. This is our diaspora. It's like this. Grandpa's mom was a breed. And as for his dad, we don't know. Her whole family knew themselves as Cherokee and their knowing and naming filtered down across the world of then into now. The quietly told stories fit into the pieces of the family trees on both sides. And when we look at names and places, where and when, who was born, it takes us into following a path for both of them from the Carolinas to Tennessee, and then into Indian territory where grandpa was born in 1894, the man who raised me. An old poem in the back of a family Bible tells of the Indian woman who captured great grandpa's heart by the Red River and of the promise they shared to be true to each other. And a final letter shows the long and enduring love they shared and the deep sorrow of her passing. As I grow up, mom tells me clearly about her strong Cherokee grandmother and what she passed down to grandpa. Grandpa tells me still another story alongside that one of the values and beliefs and ways of life his dad gave him too. And both sides come together in the boy and he is inundated, fierce and solid in what he stands for. But grandpa takes another legacy as well, a legacy of that time for breeds and stays silent out in the world he tries to fit into. He doesn't vanish or lose himself, but he keeps his own counsel. There's a huge difference and too many people vanish from even themselves, but not grandpa. He's been taught and he's seen the depth of the hatred of Indians and breeds. So he takes another path out to the West Coast in 1910, taking along the values he knows and he fits himself into the world he finds there. He rides a long, low slung Indian motorcycle, wearing his wool cap at a rakish angle and works the orchards of Orange County in turn of the century Southern California when the main street of Los Angeles was a dirt road. He's quiet and firm, resolute, a strong bodied hard worker who learned his skills sharecropping farms in Indian territory and Texas. He saves his wages and helps bring the whole family out to this new world he's found a place in. Then mom is born. And as she grows, she takes the reins of her grandmother's power, combines it with her father's surety about what's right and true. And she speaks out standing strong as a young part Cherokee woman. This was a time when most of America still admitted it hated and feared Indians, reveled in it right up front. Now, much of America has talked itself into thinking it loves the Native American, though not enough to be honest in schools, not enough to air the statistics that might make the numbers obsessed people finally care, and not enough to honor its own rule of law, which is the law of rule, Trudell sings again, clear eyed. Pipelines still cross indigenous lands and wishes despite Supreme Court rulings that lie in the dusty closets of newscasters celebrating freedom or whatever else stirs the American loins on a given day. The hatred is just different now, a face turning away from the troublemaker in a sense of peace that suits those in control of Indian life and well-being and land 
It's a tragic and forlorn face turning away from our youth who are our future. Born in the 19th century, grandpa saw the big industrial shift. He saw the radio, the airplane, the television, the pesticides promising to solve the aphid problem with no harm done, the crop dusters that brought a smile of satisfaction, a smile of hopeful trust but the promises burned away over time. His daughter disappeared from his world, a world with no schooling past fourth grade country schools. And she strode into the maw of public education as a teacher, researcher, and innovator trying to make a difference. A devil of hope that she didn't even know was an old Mephistopheles from another world, caught her by the heel, yet she tried hard almost all her life until she finally felt broken, run up against wall after wall as an independent Indian woman. It was a carrot and donkey scheme, civilization holding a bright, shiny colonial carrot. We must all get along, they'd say. The men held the carrot and let her dance in their images of themselves as innovative thinkers on the cutting edge, but when she asked for changes in the schools and what truths were actually taught, well, they'd say little steps, change takes time, be patient. The hot dog vendor on a New York corner tells the buyer who wants change for his $10 bill, change comes from within and laughs at his own joke as he turns away the money in his hand. Let the buyer beware the law of the land to beware of. Little Steps is like a fake Indian name they might give her, and then the door would close. Who was in control? Her life's work taught her who. Columbus, George Washington, who could not tell a lie except about all those Onondaga fruit trees he decimated after all the treaties were signed. And Mr. Removal himself, the ubiquitous Andrew Jackson. There were almost too many to count, and they are still addicted to control. Grandpa saw the handwriting on the wall about where this society was headed, which was downhill even for its own people and land, lost and far from the truth and living, and he geared himself to escape it, not because he hated America, he never hated it, because he liked people and had a sense of wry humor and irony, but he had to get on the outside of it to save himself. He had to let a big part of it go, like holding a lit match too long. It's all going to hell, he'd say, and he didn't even believe in hell. So he pulled out, saved his cigarette and alcohol coupons from the Second World War and bought a small farm along the banks of the Stanislaw River. He moved there when he was 51 years old, finally on his own piece of this beautiful green earth. And there he let flower what he had held silent. Mom saw a certain kind of handwriting too, but she chose another kind of fight, the head-on kind. She was too young to step outside of it all, but seeing what Grandpa was doing, going back, going back to the old ways, she handed me to him, like a relay race with a child's mind and heart, a race for survival, looking the future in the face and going for the survivance of a culture her life was robbing her of, even as she strove to live it in her own way, as she understood what it meant to her. Autonomous, independent, and proud, she had no tribe to support her, no ceremonies, no long days sitting at the prayer fire telling stories. And when we finally got her there late in life, it was just before the wind came and took the memory away from her brilliant mind and packed it into her heart. And she was beautiful there, an ancient child sitting by the fire in a white plastic chair, home at last for some moments, I trust stayed inside her forever. In those last years at home, going through her papers to try to hold on to reality, the Jehovah's Witness women, would come, mother and daughter with their sweet smiles and pamphlets, and they'd read about Jesus together. After one year reading in her small 
living room, they told mom she'd have to take down her feathers and Indian paintings, put away her gift blankets and tribal patterns from running strong for American Indian youth, a Christian group she supported. Indians are pagan people, they told her, so you should get rid of those things. And she said, oh, I can't do that. If you don't want to look at them, don't come back. The Oneida comedian Charlie Hill would have put it straight. Feathers stay, you go, and intoned like a Hollywood Indian chief. Mom took that role and smiled innocently, and the women came back anyway because they knew she loved Jesus. She was probably certain he was an Indian at that point, or her dad, or brother, or me. By that time, she had forgotten to tell them that Jesus had saved her life when she was 19, pronounced dead from pneumonia, a sheet over her head, and doctors thinking about what to say to the family. Suddenly, the room filled with light, she told me, like lightning that stayed, she described it, and she sat bolt upright, looking at him, standing all bathed and white at the foot of her bed. He told her in no uncertain terms it was not her time and that she had to live and give birth, have children. She had to keep it all going. I say all this because I live as my family and friends and elders, Cherokee, Garapaho, Chiricahua, East Alte, and others have given it to me, and I pass it on to my sons the best I can. I smile when I walk by my older son's bedroom and see his Cherokee baseball hat with the eagle embroidered on it. My young son stands clear-eyed in all that he is, singing songs with me by an equinox fire. Our blood is more mixed than ever, as they would call it, and our cultures are stronger and prouder in us as individuals and out in the tribal world too. The practice of disenrolling people from their tribal status because they marry outside is under attack today, called out as autogenocide fueled by greed, which it is in many cases, though not all. In some places, they have to protect their resources from those simply on the take, and that's their way to do it. But they all remember that blood quantum was designed to take land and resources and cultures away because it was never there before the white man or the Mexican or the Spaniard wanted what they saw the people had. I wonder if the newcomers saw the freedom and sense of fitness of place that the people had as well and thought they could steal those things too. I think so. Today, it's fitting that burgeoning indigenous cultures in the face of all the continuing forms of adversity or the strong heart standing up and saying no to what they say diminishes their power and to what destroys land and water. However, they see that as individual nations. And it's doubly beautiful that so many young ones are doing this. They see their friends falling all around them, yet they reach inside their deepest memories to find a ceremonial song, an ancient song, Culture shines a light from the other side, another matter of survival for earth and human, all humans, and this is a good thing. For me and those like me, those in our diaspora, we have no resources to protect or steal except our lives. They've already taken everything else, lives and land and language and freedom. We are diaspora's children, and all we have is our culture, and our love and dignity found every way and every place we can find it. For us, it's a matter of seeing ourselves and being seen by those we love, a manner of existing. There are millions of us, and we are turning the idea of dilution upside down. The post on Facebook with the young man planting his warland firmly on the ground says it clearly. Assimilate? No. Indigenize. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Stan. That was that was spectacular. Uh, it, uh, it, I, I, I had to catch my breath a couple of times there uh, as you were reading. It just was it was beautiful. Uh, I, a line to me that seems to capture so much of what you were saying was feathers stay, you go. 
uh, you know, and 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 that that sort of underlies what you've been telling us. I I once had the occasion to be in the uh, White House annex that's called the Executive Office Building in Washington in a meeting in what's called the Indian Treaty Room. And around the walls of that room are murals depicting signings of various treaties between the United States and certain Indian nations. These were treaties ratified by the Senate. They are the law of our land. Of course, they've not been followed. Uh, and of course, there's the famous statement, uh, infamous statement by um, President Andrew Jackson with regard to Cherokee removal. And he says to the Supreme Court Chief Justice, you've made the law, now you enforce it. Uh, and of course, that didn't happen and removal uh, on the Trail of Tears happened. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a sad and sorry story. And uh, thank you for, for taking us through it. Um, I loved... Uh, I love your image of sitting on a rock where an ancestor has sat. And I hike near here in Garland Ranch and there's some grinding rocks up, up a little draw. And when I go there, I imagine hundreds, thousands of years ago, the women sitting there grinding their, their corn, excuse me, their acorns uh, and chatting and talking there in the sun. Uh, as they've done, you know, and they did that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So I could, I could connect with what you were saying about sitting on that rock. And I also would add that I once had the uh, opportunity to be in Canyon de Chez in Arizona, uh, which is Navajo property and a Navajo uh, guide took me in there. And uh, he said something similar to what you shared with us about the end of life as you know it. And he said, in essence, you want to know about the end of life? Talk to we Indians. Uh, and, and because that canyon was the site of a horrible massacre by the US cavalry as they attempted to force the Navajo out to a, uh, through their version of a trail of tears through the snow, the relocation in Texas. Um, so thank you for taking us through this. Thank you too for the wise words you gave us. No matter the outcome, how do we comport ourselves? I think that is so terribly important. So, again, well, you know, Bob, no, go ahead. No, thank you. I just want to thank you again. Well, thank you too. And I, I just want to uh, remind everybody that it's an ongoing process, okay? And that uh, you are completely, we are surrounded by colonials, what they call colonial society. We call them the newcomers. And you were also surrounded, if you were part of the Newcomer Society, which I obviously am as well, so I have both societies inside me, both civilizations. And since we're all living here in California with the latest, uh, which is the most recent devastation, you know, 95% uh, of, of Native Californians were decimated in the latter part of the 19th century. Okay, so all that pain and all that suffering and all that killing and that desecration is still very much part of our lives. And we are all surrounded by countless numbers of descendants of these folks here today. You know, if you're in, in Carmel, if you're in the seaside, you have Linda Yamane, who did the cover for this book. You have Gary Castro. You have tons and tons and tons of people who are still needing help in protecting sacred sites. We have here, right up the street from Watsonville, where I am, we have a 300-acre sacred site that was shared you know, through prayer and song and dance for thousands upon thousands of years. It's called Hurstack, and it's about it's, a, it's poised to become an open pit gravel mine. So if you live in this area, please get a hold of your city council and get a hold of everybody you can. If you have influence at the state level, please help out because the, our dream is that that place, and there's so many places, that's a place where everybody can come together and sing and dance again. And this does not exclude white people does not exclude anybody. It's inclusive. We say every single day, 
in the morning and at night we say shahitayu, which means with all I am related, with all things, with all beings, I am related. That's a science, it's a religion, it's a faith, it's a knowledge, and it's thousands of years old. And it, it's the only attitude, I think, that can get us out of this mess. And we should not give up. I think you're right, Stan, and it is, it's, it's, it's all of these things and it's a fact. Uh, and yeah. it's, 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 it's the way we must comport ourselves yeah. uh, at the dawn of this possibly new dark age. Uh, diasporas are, are horrible. Um, some of my family were Scots and they were subject to the English ethnic cleansing after the Battle of Culloden in 1746. And they were absolutely forced out of Scotland to all corners of the world, right. forbidden to speak Gaelic, forbidden to wear the tartan. Uh, they were wiped off the earth. Uh, right. And, and it, we do it, humans do it to ourselves. And our only redemption, I agree with you, is how are we gonna comport ourselves uh, in this time and these times and coming together at the sacred place that, that you've just mentioned and other sacred places, I think is, is an important part of doing that. So thank like you. Like this so space, like this place here. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. Well said. So I, I, I really want to uh, thank you for your thank you. And uh, I'm sorry I missed Andy. Fortunately, we're good buddies. So I'll be able to hear him again. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's here. You know, I don't know how many folks are there, but I want to thank you all. Uh, for listening, because when you listen, that makes my poetry alive. All right. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for thank you. Bring, bringing it alive to us. Uh, it's been a wonderful virtual uh, gathering. Uh, and uh, we, we will we continue this. We do this every month. Uh, the next gathering is on June 12th. Uh, Nathan Osorio and Daniel Summerhill. Uh, will be our two poets, Daniel being the poet laureate uh, of Monterey County, the first one. Uh, and uh, it'll be via Zoom. Uh, for more information, you can contact Kent Latham, uh, our, our leader and our coordinator, kent.latham at poet, kent.latham.poet at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, his address is on the um, uh, mail email notice that I sent out to you. Please do be sure to like us on Facebook and please do check out our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, Stan, when we are able to post today's video uh, up on the channel, uh, you'll be able to see Andrew uh, and what he has said to us. And so thank you for that. Well, thanks again, folks. It's been a, a wonderful afternoon. Uh, I'm going to ask Stan and Andrew to stay on for a little bit after everybody's left, and we can do a uh, screenshot that I will then put on our Facebook page to uh, memorialize and celebrate today. So thank you all. Uh, please come again next month. Uh, and in the meantime, take good care. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You always, Bob. Thank you all.